Dr. Nathaniel Wade, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. Yeah, we got a, a timely topic for today, timely for today, but pretty much timely every day, um, which is forgiveness, forgiving others and forgiving ourselves. And first, I'd love for you to sort of introduce yourself and, um, you know, the, you know, the fact that you're, you study this and you're research based and, and all, all those good uh, bona fides. Okay, sounds great. Uh, so I'm a professor of psychology uh, here at Iowa State University. Um, I got my degree back in 2003 um, from Virginia Commonwealth University. I was studying under Everett Worthington, who's probably one of two or three uh, international pioneers in the study of forgiveness from a psychological perspective. Um, after that, after I got my degree, I, I came here to Iowa State at that point and um, in grad school. And then since I've been here, I've studied uh, forgiveness, most often from a perspective of uh, how to help people in a psychotherapy setting. Um, so training therapists, uh, working with clients to understand what their experience of forgiveness is in a therapy setting. Uh, but of course, those, uh, that, that work, that information is, is really applicable to, to all kinds of different settings. Um, so with forgiveness, I've often focused uh, on how to help people to forgive others who have hurt them, uh, oftentimes in some pretty significant ways. Uh, in more recent years, I've turned my attention uh, as well on helping people to forgive themselves for uh, burdens that they carry uh, for ways in which they've hurt other people. Mm. Gotcha. And you, you have a pretty interesting, I guess it's not an origin story, <laughs> uh, but, but a, a kind of focusing story about how this became much more than, than theoretical because right you you yeah. were you were studying forgiveness because you had a uh, an advisor who told you we're going to study forgiveness right <laughs> that's right that's right in fact I, and then I and then life made a joke yes yes isn't that the truth yeah so when i showed up at uh, in 1998 uh in richmond virginia to start to start my phd in counseling psychology um, my main thought was I was actually going to be doing uh, religion and spirituality as it plays out in psychotherapy. That was kind of my original um, interest in the area. And um, my first meeting with, with Ev, I left the office with a stack full of papers that was back before the days of electronic PDFs and uh, left just with an armful of papers on forgiveness. And he said, you know, this semester where we're going to be working on uh, a paper that I've been invited to to write on on forgiveness. So that was uh, fall of '98. Well, about two months later, um, I um, found out that my wife at the time was uh, seeing somebody else. And so while I was in the midst of writing this review paper on forgiveness and talking with Ev intellectually about, you know, what is forgiveness. Um, when, when do we need to offer it, when not, you know, kind of all the different parameters around it. Um, I was going through my own pretty shocking experience in, in my marriage. Mm. And what, I mean, what was, you know, I could ask like, what was it like to feel betrayed, but like, what was it like to be doing these two things at once to, yeah. cause I, you know, like so many of us go into helping professions because of the help that we need, but it's usually not that like volcanically <laughs> condensed. Yeah, that's so true. Um, you know, I think in the fall, um, I found out that was kind of the first inclination that she was some, seeing someone else. And her reaction to that was, you know, nothing's really happened. We've talked, but nothing. And, and so she kind of recommitted to the relationship uh, with me. And so um, at the time, it you know, for sure there was hurt feelings and confusion, but there wasn't quite the same sense of betrayal that came later. So at the time I was like, oh, okay, this is interesting. And hmm, there's a little irony happening here, but it didn't really strike me. It wasn't until later that the summer of 99. So it was the next, you know, maybe nine months or 10 months later um, when I found out that even though she and I had been trying to work on our relationship, she had actually continued uh, and deepened her connection with this other guy 
and um, they had been romantically involved for months by the time I found out the, the mm -hmm. second time. And at that point, it really hit me of like, oh my goodness, like the irony was super thick um, for me. You know, and then it probably wasn't again, you know, fast forward another maybe six months till it really like hit for me in terms of like the help that the work I was doing gave me personally. And one of the things that really helped so much was an understanding of the difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. So mm. this was one of the pieces in that opening uh, article that I worked on with Ev that we made a big deal about um, was forgiveness is not the same thing as reconciling with someone. And so we really tried to say, well, if it's not, then what is forgiveness? And we talked about it as being an internal process that happened whereby someone changes from the, the bitterness, the anger, the vengefulness, and moves more toward a, a place of maybe neutrality or even care, support, um, and, and love for the person again. And so as I thought about that in my own life, I was stuck with this situation of like, you know, um, well, when I found out the second time in the summertime, we, we split. I was, you know, I needed space at that point. And so we were separated, but we hadn't made any decision about the divorce. And so I, um, in that process, really, you know, came to realize um, here's kind of where the rubber meets the road with this forgiveness and reconciliation stuff, because I knew I wanted to, at some point, move on from it. You know, I, the, the anger and the vengefulness, yeah, I didn't want to carry that with me. I didn't want that to infect future relationships that I might have. I wanted to kind of, you know, uh, find peace from that. But I, all, but I didn't know whether I wanted to be in a relationship with her going forward. Mm -hmm. um, and so being able to understand that, that forgiveness was an internal process for me, but reconciliation was more of the, the trust building and the rebuilding of the relationship, I was able to kind of take those two processes and separate them and say, okay, let me just work on the forgiveness for now. Um, let me see what I want to do about that. And then we'll move toward the idea of reconciliation or not. And it was another, I think it was another year. I'm not sure about the timeline, but it might've been about another year or so until we actually moved ahead with the divorce. Um, and I made the decision of, you know what? I don't want to reconcile with her in the sense of getting back together. You know, we were, we were able to go to the divorce and it was amicable enough. And, you know, there wasn't, you know, which I felt fortunate about. Um, but I did certainly work on forgiving. And at this point can say, I've forgiven her for that, um, for those experiences. I have a lot more empathy. I have a lot more understanding for perhaps what happened for her. Um, and I've been able to kind of move beyond it. Right, I, I, that brings up so many questions for me. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the thing I wanna sort of highlight in terms of my understanding of the difference between forgiveness and reconciliation, at least functionally, is that I don't need anything from her in order to forgive, right? There's, there's, there's no dependence. There's no... Um, uh, it's like no necessary steps or anything that she has to take, like that kind of idea? Yeah, I'm not, I'm, yeah. I'm not, I, I'm not, I'm not vulnerable to, like, I have total control over whether I forgive. I have yeah. no control over whether there's a reconciliation. Right. right. Yep. That's, you know, and that's one of the things that we found to be really important from our perspective. Now, you know, I should say uh, for your listeners that not everybody in the academic world agrees with us on our definition of forgiveness. You know, some folks who are looking at uh, forgiveness from a different perspective or who are looking in a different context than us might include more of that reconciliation element in their forgiveness. For us, mm -hmm. though, it became really important because of that reason you're talking about. Here, you know, we're licensed psychologists, you know, we're studying psychotherapy. So our perspective is what happens when we have a client in front of us who says, you know, I've been dealing with this pain that this person has done to me. You know, you can think of the quintessential kind of example in psychotherapy of a, of a person who as a child maybe was abused in some way by a parent who is unrepentant, who is, denies it, you know, well, shouldn't that, you know, shouldn't there be some pathway forward for that person? Again, if they want to forgive, I'd never be in a situation with a client where I'd tell them that they should forgive or they have to forgive. It's not about morality for us in psychotherapy. It's really about health. So 
Is this what you want? Is this something that you'd like to consider? Does this help you to live a healthier life? And if so, then as psychologists, we wanna be able to help you to move toward that. And so, as you said, in those situations, we think, yeah, you can move towards forgiveness. You might not be able to reconcile with that person. That person might remain toxic to you. And so we might say, let's move toward forgiveness, but let's not, let's keep a strong boundary with that person and not move toward uh, kind of a, a reconciliation in that sense. Right. Well, you know, child abuse, like the central essence of that is a power imbalance, yeah. you know, an extreme, totally. a total power imbalance. And That's so right. to say forgiveness must include reconciliation is giving power to the abuser. Right. Exactly. That's exactly right. Yeah. And which is so important for folks in that situation, whether it's an abuse situation or whether there's other kinds of hurts, it's being able to bring back some sense of control um, to the, the person that was victimized or, or hurt um, by the other person. Right. And I'm thinking about a quote. I can't remember where it's from and I may mess it up a little bit, but sort of like my boundary is the distance at which I can love both you and me simultaneously. Ah, that's great. I like that one a lot. Yeah, and I think that fits with what we're talking about here. Absolutely. Yeah. So one, one thing that I think comes up a lot in sort of couples counseling around the various issues that people face is like assume positive intent, right? Like when you're in the thing, like they said that thing, well, yeah, they're just a bitch or they're an asshole, but like, no, let's like, what are they trying to achieve? And we want to you know, be generous in our assumptions. And I'm wondering, as you were going through your process of forgiving your ex-wife um, or your wife at that point, <laughs> to your yeah. future ex-wife, yeah. um, was, it, was it important to attribute positive intent to her? Or could you, can you forgive even saying, you know what, she really was doing this to be you know, selfish, hurtful, greedy, yeah. immature, whatever as opposed to like really getting it like, well, there were her needs that weren't being met and like. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, I think, so what we know from, from the research that we've done and others have done is that certainly if um, you are able to build some sort of empathy for the person who hurt you, then um, you're much more likely to forgive. So we do know that. Um, that's kind of an initial uh, response. And I think you're absolutely right that perspective taking or that, um, that good intent or trying to find uh, what that other person might have been thinking or doing um, rather than just demonizing them, um, which is so easy to do when we're hurt. You know, it's just like you said, oh, they're, well, they're just a jerk. You know, that's why they did it um, or they wanted to hurt me. Um, and so, you know, in fact, in some of the interventions that we do for folks um, in some of the re um, research that I've done, I've, I've uh, tested interventions to help people to forgive. And one of the interventions we use is um, related to this idea, you know, exactly, is stepping back and trying to um, think about the offender's situation, like what was happening. Again, we make this distinction between, you know, kind of condoning the action and forgiveness. So forgiving someone is not condoning it. It's not saying mm -hmm. that what they did is right. In fact, to forgive them, you have to first say what they did was wrong or else there's nothing to forgive. Huh. And so we, we help people to make that distinction. And then we walk them through an intervention where we might have them, for example, write a letter that's, that's um, uh, addressed to them. So in my case, I'd say, you know, dear Nathaniel, and then I would write it from the person who hurt me's perspective. Mm. And what I instruct the folks to do is, you know, of course, you could write a letter where you're like, you know, I'm terrible. I'm a jerk. I shouldn't have done that. You're the best person in the world. So, but that's not really going to help you toward forgiveness. Instead, really try to put yourself in that person's shoes as much as you can and think about what would they say. And, and if you want to write in there, I'm sorry for what I did. Great. There's nothing wrong with that. But also include in there, what was it that they might have been thinking? What was it that they might have been doing? Um, the struggle. So, so then, you know, more personally to answer your question about my situation, um, I think it took a long time for me to get that kind of perspective. I think um, uh, so that it's kind of like almost like layers of forgiveness in a sense, you know, the, the first year and a half, the first two years, it was just mostly anger and bitterness, um, you know, where I wrote poems and, 
and talk to friends and things and it and there was not much generosity in me at that point at all i was just mm -hmm. hurt um and angry and then i think there was another layer you know kind of an initial layer of forgiveness where it was like okay i want to get some space from this i want to kind of give her maybe a little bit of the benefit of the doubt i don't really know what she was going through you know i roll my eyes a little like well i would never do that but you know okay i'll try to and then maybe years later there was a deeper layer of of understanding more about our relationship understanding maybe the situations she found herself in from her perspective not mine that might have made it very difficult and and might have made this other guy much more attractive and and what she got from him might have been exactly what she needed at that point and and how hard it probably was for her to to do that and also to not do it and how she must you know so they were able but that was years later that i was able mm -hmm. to get that place and that helped me maybe to go another letter with the forgiveness right and i guess when we're thinking about forgiving helping others forgive or forgiving ourselves is you know the, you know but just like you can't hurry love i guess you can't hurry forgiveness yeah yeah and it's so unique you know you can't hurry it some people are actually pretty quick about it and and then there's other people that you know it's a long long time and and of course as you would imagine some of that's related to the depth of the hurt to the shock that's associated with it to whether you've been through something like that in the past or not um but then there are just individual differences we know um back early on uh ev and i and some other colleagues put together a scale um to measure the disposition to forgive so this is the tendency that people have um, to forgive. And, and we were able to, through a series of studies, um, be pretty confident that there are actual real differences in the tendencies people have to forgive people kind of across situations and across time. Um, wow. Some of us are really good at it and some of us are not good at it at all. Oh, I have so many questions about that. Like, is that, <laughs> is that one of the, like the big five, like, like, like it, like where it's a trait that's sort of resilient over time or yeah so you know we don't have quite the same data as like a big five um in terms of longitudinally so like being able to track people say over 20 years or 30 years and and how consistent is it but we were able to track them over you know a six months or a year we've done that and that's very stable um in that amount of time um and we were able to correlate it with other um measures some of the personality uh indicators of the big five and and other things that shows that it's related to those but it's not the same thing as those mm -hmm. um, as you would imagine you know in personality someone who tends to be more agreeable which is one of the big five um is more likely to be a, a higher forgiving person um mm -hmm. but those do not necessarily track right on top of each other either right and the yeah. other thing i'm wondering is does the disposition to forgive correlate with outcomes? Yes, it does. So it depends though on the situations, which is which is really interesting. And some of the work that I've done, I have, um, you know, you could call it mixed findings on that. And I think it has to do with, you know, what specifically we're looking at. So in some situations where we've done intervention studies, the trait forgiveness, the tendency to forgive, um, is correlated with with greater forgiveness at the end or or you know how much people change at the end um, and in other studies we found that it wasn't correlated i think one of the factors of that is kind of the situational factor of what we're bringing um what the participants are bringing to the study and so if we're reaching people who um are willing to kind of come to a, a therapy study for forgiveness then those are folks who have been hurt and are really stuck in it you know um, they've maybe tried to um, get beyond it in in kind of more everyday ways by talking to friends and family by you know using their religious or spiritual uh, resources by you know doing other things like that and they've not been able to get beyond it and so at that point you kind of have more of a homogenous group and then it doesn't matter what their trait forgiveness is specifically with that hurt because mm -hmm. that's why they're in the study is is to to work on that um, but we certainly see that that in general, in more of a kind of a general population, uh, that tendency to forgive broadly, the trait is um, very, uh, very much related to whether people forgive a specific offense or not. Uh -huh. 
What, what about more broadly to not just the outcome of, uh, of a re you know, recovering or forgiving a slight, but like happiness, life yeah. satisfaction, psychological stability? Is there? Yeah. Yeah. I haven't done this work myself, but um, some folks who have um, have really shown some pretty consistent findings. And honestly, even as a researcher in this area, it's kind of shocking to me. It's like over time, um, one, if you look at it from like a longitudinal perspective uh, and or uh, if you look at it um, from a, what we think of as like a cohort perspective where you might look at uh, a bunch of different age groups, it tends that particularly for older folks or over time, um, that chronic, what you might think of as like a chronic unforgiveness or, or a, the, a trait disposition toward unforgiveness is actually correlated with some uh, really foundational health indices, like uh, certainly well-being, physical health, physical symptoms. Um, there's some research that shows that uh, forgiveness is related to uh, uh, like diastolic uh, blood pressure to, you know, like stress hormones. I mean, it's just like, as you might think, you know, that tendency toward that anger and, and frustration and revenge pumps up the system in ways that over time chronically can be very hurtful. Yeah. So if, if forgiveness is sort of moving to neutral, caring, supporting, loving, can we talk about what not forgiveness is in a, in a functional sense? Like, is it sort of a, um, a compulsive loop? Like you know, when you talk about it, like yeah. raising diastolic or whatever, yeah, yeah. Like, do we know? Yep. So one of some of the things we know um, early on in that initial paper um, where I uh, worked on with Thev in that very first semester of grad school, one of the things we hypothesized was that um, rumination would be a key factor in perpetuating a state of unforgiveness. So again, not not the trait or disposition, but just when you've been hurt specifically. Um, that for people who continue to stay in an unforgiving kind of state about that, we thought that, uh, uh, we hypothesized that it would be rumination that would keep that going. And rumination um, is just briefly is that uh, process of kind of cognitively replaying events over and over again, you know, kind of that, that cow chewing its cud over and over and over again. Um, and so, um, then in some of the studies, we haven't done exhaustive work in this area, but, but we have looked at it in a few different ways. And um, it, it does appear that the tendency to ruminate is certainly correlated with uh, unforgiveness. And so um, that would be one of the processes by which that happens. Mm, not sure. Um, the other thing I'm curious about, you're going back to this, the story about you and, and your wife, is so now you're a you know full-fledged researcher you said earlier that it you know gave you a certain empathy like is there a correlation between forgiveness and learning mm. like you know the ability to grow from an event because a couple of weeks ago i, I uh, interviewed a um, couples therapist susan orenstein talk, who's talking about uh, after the first marriage yeah. So how you don't repeat the mistakes of the first marriage and the second marriage, whether it's with somebody new or with like your old partner sort of upgrade marriage 2.0. Right. And like her work is all about learning from it. So you yeah. make better choices going forward. And I'm wondering if, for, if forgiveness you know, kind of needs to happen or, or enhances that process. Well, you have just created the next great uh, research question. <laughs> in forgiveness, um, at least as far as I know. So from a, from a research perspective, I think that's a fabulous question. Um, and I could imagine designing a study where we looked at um, folks who forgived versus folks who didn't forgive and watch them over time and then be able to actually measure to what degree are they repeating their interpersonal patterns and to what degree are they moving on from and, and resolving some of them. Um, so, but but in terms of answering your question, I'm not sure. I, I don't know. Um, mm. You know, I, I have some hints or uh, maybe just some personal attitudes and beliefs about it. All right, so uh, what are, what, what's the null hypothesis? <laughs> <laughs> I, 
<laughs> so, you know, I would think that I would think that absolutely forgiveness would lead to learning. I would think that um, that there would be, you know, I think you could even drill that down even into and talk about it from uh, kind of cognitive states kind of perspective. Um, I think of Barbara, Barbara uh, Fredrickson's uh, broaden and build theory, you know, that uh, that positive psychology idea of, you know, and if you're in a forgiving state, you're much more likely to be able to look at new and creative options. You're, you're, you're broadening and building, you know, you're bigger, you're able to look um, mm. and see things um, that maybe you didn't see before. You're willing to try things more creatively, uh, say, for example, in a relationship than you had before. Whereas if you're in a state of unforgiveness, you're much more in that narrow fight or flight kind of mindset. And my guess is you'd be tend to, to kind of, again, lean on those cognitive heuristics of you do what you do. This is what I do. Um, and so I interact with, you know, my partner in this particular way, or, and this is, I, I don't even see any other way of doing it again, because I'm kind of blinded in a sense by that fight or flight response, uh, of unforgiveness. Yeah. Is being in a state of unforgiveness equivalent to being in fight or flight to be in sort of a defensive mode? I think that's a great question. Um, I, I would think they're distinct to some degree, um, but for sure there's elements to it. So, you know, I might talk about a state of unforgiveness more broadly than like a fight or flight state, but if you're in, a, in more of a state of unforgiveness, um, we can think of it this way maybe, where you're in a place where you're much more likely to enter fight or flight, kind of the, the more, um, uh, time limited aspect of fight or flight, whereas unforgiveness state would be the broader context within which those happen. So give you a, a kind of an example. Um, when you're in a state of unforgiveness, you know, imagine seeing that person who hurt you. I mean, so much easier, you know, it's like snap, I'm all of a sudden in like rage mode. You know, because I'm primed for that. That's the state I'm in. I'm feeling vengeful. I'm feeling upset. You know, and if this isn't somebody you live with, but this is somebody that maybe you see, uh, you know, at a particular organization or work or, you know, at the grocery store and it's like, boom, um, you know, the, the, the fight or flight lights go off, so to speak, you know, they start firing. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're in a forgiving state, you might still have some of that, but it's much quicker to kind of come down for it. You know, there's great research on this from a, you know, a physiological perspective. Um, uh, uh, Kathleen Lawler Rowe Ro did some work on this where she hooked people up to blood pressure machines and, and uh, pulse and uh, heart rate stuff and, and then had them talk about stories that were either uh, ones that they had forgiven or ones they had. Hmm. And one of the interesting things she found is, you know, the, the blood pressure went up, the, you know, the heart rate went up, but in the forgiving stories, they came off and they came down a lot quicker. Um, mm. Charlotte Whitfleet did some great work on this in multiple different studies. Um, and she found very similar things, even when people just imagined um, situations where they forgave someone or imagined, no, instead, what if you, un you know, what if you were bitter toward them or, or what if they accept, you know, gave you an apology or didn't um, and mm. tracked their um, uh, physiology, not just blood pressure, but also kind of skin conductance and, and other things and, and show that mm. there is a very strong physiological reaction in these uh, forgiving and unforgiving situations. Yeah. I wonder if it works in the other direction as well. So, you know, I'm thinking about sort of forgiveness or non-forgiveness and very simplistically as like cortisol or oxytocin. Yeah. Um, like, can you put, give people, you know, um, experiences that's more likely to elicit oxytocin, like show them a moving video, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. then see if they are more amenable to forgiveness. Yeah. Yeah. You could definitely do that. I haven't, I, I'm not aware of any uh, studies that have done something like that, although, you know, certainly it may be out there. Um, but I think there's, you're almost talking about like a priming effect where you kind of prime mm -hmm. people one way or another. And then how do they maybe think about or talk about these hurtful experiences as a result of that? That's very possible. Um, you know, we know that having people write about um, 
stories in particular ways can have the uh, have an effect on how they um, recall it. Um, and so, you know, and part of our forgiveness and unforgiveness is, you know, we could bring in, a, I, I'm not a memory expert by any stretch, but we could bring in a little bit of understanding that way too is, you know, we are creating our memory, we're creating our story and we're recreating our story. And so if I had spent the last, you know, 15 to 20 years of my life, um, spinning the story and recreating the story of the affair and the, how unfair it was for her to do this and how hurtful it was, where would I be now 20 years later versus telling the story where I was hurt and then I moved to forgiveness. And after mm. about five years, I felt like I was in a place where I was pretty forgiving and had moved on. And, you know, I like to think I'm in a much healthier place now than I would have been had I been telling myself and kind of generating that that uh, those kind of hormones that you talk about and things like that mm. um so one thing i'm thinking like when we're talking about forgiveness so far we've talked about extremes so you know a betrayal abuse right. there's also people who piss me off like all the time in, <laughs> in little ways right and i'm wondering is like forgiveness um useful is just sort of like like hygiene like brushing my teeth like to, like somebody said something or somebody didn't you know return my call like those little things that i feel like i'm too mature to get bothered by yeah. but i'm bothered by <laughs> i love your honesty aren't we all oh my goodness um you know i the, the thought about like uh you know forgiveness as a kind of good hygiene good mental hygiene uh, i think is an interesting one for sure I, I tend to think of and be, you know, this is just my bias. I tend to reserve forgiveness for kind of the, you know, the, the say bigger events um, in life, the ones that, that don't recede from our, our memories uh, within a few days or a couple of weeks. Um, you know, another thought that I had to that is when, when Ev and I tried to, to, uh, kind of delineate or, or mark out the, the field of forgiveness for us and kind of what we were working on. Um, we also came up with a list of um, ways that people deal with being hurt that doesn't have to do with forgiveness. Um, and so that was actually kind of a really important to us to say, um, you know what, there's a whole list of ways that people deal with being hurt. Um, that don't really have to do with forgiveness, that don't have to do with kind of the, that internal work of, of uh, resolving bitterness and moving toward compassion and love and, and that transformational experience. Um, you know, just to give you some examples, people seek vengeance, people seek justice, um, people uh, forbear it. Uh, and by that, we mean they just simply kind of let it go. They don't even go into the whole process. They just, whatever. Um, you know, other people use their religious and spiritual resources, like I talked about earlier, and they may transform it into kind of a spiritual practice, um, or, uh, even a religious, religious right of some sort to, to manage these, these things. Um, people go to kind of their families to deal with these issues, like, hey, my brother really pissed me off and I don't care that we're both, you know, in our 40s, we're going to go to mom and we're going to let her settle it. Um, <laughs> you know, so there's there's all kinds of different ways that people deal with it. And, and our take has always been that forgiveness is just one of them. And it's not uh -huh. necessarily always the best one. Um, people have to make those distinctions. But for people who are looking to forgive, we wanted to create a knowledge base um, by which they could do that. Mm -hmm. Right, but when I'm reflecting on that list that you just mentioned, it feels like forgiveness is different from the others in the opportunity that it provides. Yeah. It's, it's more than just sort of like filling in the hole and getting back to zero. Like if yeah. you could magically erase the affair and the betrayal, yeah. you'd be you know, like, okay, it never happened. As opposed to the forgiveness actually gives you a positive, doesn't it? It's, it's sort of growth and development and, and I think a, a higher spiritual uh, capacity. Yeah. yeah, I absolutely agree with you. You know, one of the things that I, uh, you know, to come back to your idea of kind of the, the mental, mental hygiene or habit, perhaps kind of a daily habit, I think that forgiveness really taps into, I think it's a different concept, but I think it 
is very uh, related is the idea of the common humanity that so many spiritual traditions talk about. And I think that's so essential to forgiveness. Because I think if you come from a perspective that, again, in my value system, I might call less mature, um, that's maybe more self-focused or self-centered, um, you know, you think you're pretty special. And other people, especially people who hurt you, are, you know, pretty defective. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that there is a real opportunity, as you talked about it, in forgiveness, um, where we can really embrace this broader idea of the common humanity. You know what? We're all in this together. And even if I haven't actually done that thing that my ex-wife did to me, I'm certainly capable of it. You know, I've got that in me. And I've hurt people in, in very um, kind of to the degree as well as she did to me. So I'm not special in that sense. You know, it's not that she's so terrible and evil and I'm so good and wonderful. Instead, we're all trying to figure this out. And I think there is a, uh, to me, that's a real important spiritual principle um, of that common humanity. Yeah, I guess it reminds me of sort of, the, you know, the Buddha story, like, you, like the world is gonna break us, yeah. right? That not, none of us is gonna get through this world without being hurt tremendously and none of us is going to get through this world without hurting other people right. tremendously like I, yes. I saw a meme a while back it said like remember that there's a bunch of people in therapy because of you <laughs> that's great absolutely <laughs> i mean what a good perspective isn't it it's it's corrective to our own egotism yeah right. um and so one thing that i i do want to get into kind of the the steps, like in the article that, that I found that introduced me to you, um, there was like, here's, here's a plan. Yeah. And, and I, you know, you see these in like, you know, popular magazines, but the fact that it was a plan and that it was research-based really yeah. um, attracted me. And one of the things that you, you already said was like, the first step is not pretending that nothing happened, that nothing was wrong. Right. But so you can't if there's no point in forgiving if you don't first say they did something wrong. And I think like that's the hang up that you know, so many people that, that I was so, like, it just th that cleaved away all the cobwebs for me. Yeah. Like, oh, forgiving them means I condone it or that it wasn't such a bad thing or it wasn't serious or I should have gotten over it. Right. And it's, it's just the opposite. I feel like that insight in and of itself is so empowering. Yeah, absolutely. That's so well said too. Um, it, it, you know, forgiveness is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> you know, <laughs> forgiveness is not for the person, like you said, who, well, I, I should have gotten it over by now. And now there's something wrong with me because I didn't, and I have to, you know, I didn't forgive or whatever. No. Um, yeah. And this, in the, in the program or the steps that you're talking about that I outlined in that article, um, are, were originally developed by Ev Worthington and, and then uh, I've gone on and, and done several research studies on them, mostly in a group format whereby I bring, you know, groups of six to eight people together uh, with a facilitator and, and uh, go through these steps and, and then test the effectiveness of them. And that first step, so his is really easy uh, to remember because it's reach forgiveness. That's the model. So it's R-E-A-C-H. Um, and those are his five broad steps. And the first one R of reach is recall the hurt. And that's it. We're, we spend time, significant time with folks just helping them to share what happened to them. Mm. Um, and so when we, do, when we do groups, that's really therapeutic. You know, not only do you get to share it with a facilitator who's trained to, to help you, but you share it with other people in your group who you know, come alongside and care for you and, and hear you and validate your story. Um, and mm. that in itself can be a big step toward healing for folks, but it's absolutely I, I imagine, the foundation. Yeah. And I imagine that's also really important for rapport and, you know, rapport. Yeah. Because, you you know, like, okay, like we want to say, okay, you've been ruminating over this your whole life, drop it already. <laughs> right. But, right. But Would you say, just like, get I, over I, it already? <laughs> yeah. yeah, we have but a, to give, yeah, to give the person space. <laughs> To kind of lay it out, and you know, you're there with them. That probably, you know, in a in a therapeutic yeah. relationship, in a counseling relationship, that probably serves a a higher purpose of of, of creating the therapeutic 
bond. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when I was when I was early on in grad school, Ev wouldn't let me, but I thought we could do a three word intervention, get over it and test it. But he, he wouldn't <laughs> let me implement it. I don't know why. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, you're, you're hard, right. Stop it. Right. Stop it. Two words. Oh, see, you're good at this. <laughs> uh, yeah, it does. It helps to build that trust that I'm not here as a facilitator to, you know, again, uh, beat you over the brow with what you should do and what you didn't do or, or the ways in which you've been inadequate. Not at all. It's all about the, the, the foundation of the intervention is all about validating like, yeah, this is horrible. Like, this is terrible. This should not have happened to you. And it stinks that it did. And here we are. So now what? Now what do we do? Mm -hmm. so. Right. And I guess also, if you, if you don't allow them to recall it in all its color and intensity, then they're forgiving something lesser. They're not, it's like, you know, you're doing surgery, but you're not getting all of the tumor. That's right. Yeah, that's, that's also a good way of understanding uh, what's happening in that first step. Okay. Great, so we got the R. Okay, so E would be empathy. Uh, and that is what we talked about just a little bit ago, really trying to help people to uh, develop empathy for the person that hurt them. And that can happen in all kinds of different ways. Um, you know, it, it can be in the sense of, um, oh, if I take some time, I can really see where they were coming from. You know, the reality is most of us, like you said, a lot of people are in therapy because of what we've done. Um, most of us can look at and say, you know, when we hurt other people, we usually do it. We're trying to either solve some kind of difficult situation we're in, some problem we're in, um, or it's some kind of neglect that we just didn't get at the moment or at the time. Very seldom is there pure evil intent. Now that, that does exist. And, you know, Yes, we can talk about that too, but that's maybe for another podcast. Um, but most of the hurts that we experience with most of the people in our life are, are kind of like, they just, you know, it's a mistake. So we can find some sort of empathy. And it, again, it might be because like, I find specific empathy of like, wow, okay, I see exactly what they were doing when they did this. And now that helps me to understand better. Or mm -hmm. it might be broader empathy of like, okay, there's really no understanding why they actually did that and they they should not have happened at all however i can do a broader empathy of like yeah uh, you know i've i've been clueless at times too or i've you know that sort of thing okay. so is there and i don't know if danger is the right word but i'll use it is yeah. there a danger in when you empathize with someone else that you suddenly have the need for self-forgiveness because you're like oh man i was a jerk too um yes I think, um, so a need for self-forgiveness, I will give you, yes, absolutely. I think most folks don't go there, don't go to self-forgiveness right away. I, you know, my experience has been as most people are pretty critical of themselves um, and don't often let themselves off the hook either. As much as they're kind of, and this would be a, you know, interesting to uh, explore as well, the degree to which they hold themselves accountable do they hold others accountable? Um, and I think for the most part, people are pretty rough on themselves. So, but that does bring up a need for self-forgiveness, yes, but yeah. not necessarily a, a natural process to forgive the self. Right, yeah, I think that's what I was trying that's to get at. It's like, you know, when we're in this fight or flight, things can get very binary. Yeah. So if suddenly I realize that you have legitimate cause for upset, I, oh my God, if it was all my fault, I'm terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Like it's just, yeah, it just I think folks can target. go there. That's right. Yep. And trying to find that, you know, you know, that's part of a, a lot of what that intervention is um, in helping to forgive others is really about balancing these. It's, it's about balancing like, um, you know, one way I like to think of it is, you know, it's that more complex thinking, you know, that that is in some of the Buddhist teaching of it's not about or it's about and it's about both, you know, is it this or mm. this? Yes, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's both, you know, like just because um, there was a part that you might've played in that, the events where the person hurt you, doesn't then make it okay that they hurt you. Um, and it doesn't take away from the fact that you were hurt um, and doesn't take away from your progress toward forgiveness. So there's kind of a holding of both of those. Um, mm -hmm. You know, another difficulty I think that people hold that 
struggle to hold that we talk explicitly about in the interventions is, um, if I forgive, then I lose my anger. And if I lose my anger, then I lose the boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, I had a client once who talked to me about that, um, where I brought up this idea in struggling with, with, uh, with an ex. And I said, well, have you considered forgiveness? Have you talk, thought about forgiveness? And her answer is, I can't let go of the anger because if I do, I don't know what'll happen. The sense of everything will fall apart. Um, I, I won't be able to hold a boundary, a safety that the anger creates. And um, so we try and hold this idea of like, can we find boundaries without the bitterness? You know, can we find the boundaries without the anger? Um, right. Can you move toward forgiveness and still keep that person at a safe distance? Right. And, and the fact that you're raising those as questions brings up for me, like this forgiveness is like the ultimate act of faith. Mm. How do you see that? Tell me more. Um, that if I, if I, I don't know what happens without my anger, because right. I haven't, I haven't been in that position. Yes. So it's, at some point I have to have faith in something that maybe, you know, that I will create a boundary that I won't need a boundary. Right? I'm trying to imagine something that doesn't exist. That's right. And, and that anger, you know, that anger is my, is my armor, like to put down my armor, to make my, is to make myself vulnerable to being hurt. That's right. Yep. And, and from a therapist perspective, um, that's really important for us to be aware of, to be able to say, you know, as you're doing the forgiveness process, you have to have enough resources to give your clients to be able to say like, and instead of this bitterness, this is the, the strategy for putting that armor on. This is the armor you can wear with that person. And, um, and with some folks, that's just explicit, like, you know, um, work with them on here's role plays that we can do when this person comes to you and says hey i'm around i'd like to come over tonight what do you say <laughs> you know like no mm. and just because i forgave you for that time you cheated on me doesn't mean that now i say yes like screw you like no but it doesn't become about what happened five years ago it mm. becomes about what's happening right now and i can be in the present i don't have to live in the past but I can also keep myself safe from you because I don't trust that you're just coming, you know, that you're going to be committed to me right now. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. So another thing about empathy that I worry about for myself yeah. is this, like it's, it's complicated, but the difference between like an explanation and a rationalization. Yeah. Um, and here's what I'm thinking. Um, I'm a progressive politically. Okay. We have just today um, inaugurated a new president over the past four, you know, seven right. million people voted for someone whom I see as completely odious, um, yep. hateful against everything I am for. And at some point, there's part of me that says, like, I want to understand people who voted for this man yeah. so that I can be in relation so that we can heal. And at the same time, there's part of me that says, I can't, you know, yo, you are dead to me. You voted right. for him. You know, right. there's no, there's no, there's no explanation that would possibly be okay. Right. And I struggle with that. Right. Oh, so you and almost everybody else in this country. I mean, this is a, a, this is such a real issue that, that we've been, you know, we've been dealing with it probably on and off as long as the U.S. has been the U.S. But for sure, it's been really bad. Uh, in the last, well, for sure, last four years, but even before that, we were we were polarizing more and more. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's certainly come to a to a head this last week, and uh, with the capital stuff. I mean, you know, for sure, there's real issues about how do we talk to others, how do we who are different from us, who believe different than us. How do we stay in relationship with people who are different than us? I think for so many folks, I mean, me included, a lot of the strategy comes down to like, you know, we're just not going to talk about it. Like we can stay in relationship as long as we don't address that. Um, but I think there's something better. I think there's something deeper that can happen um, if both parties can be committed to this idea of, you know, what we talk about in, in our basic counseling skills is active listening. 
the listening that really listens for the other person's experience rather than just listening in order to form my own argument to tell you how stupid you are, mm. right? It's that, that active empathic listening. And I think right. that, you know, there is a capacity to build empathy for another that, that does make you open to change potentially, but that doesn't necessitate that you change or it doesn't necessitate that you agree or even condone um, their beliefs or their, the actions that have come from their beliefs or whatever. Um, but that can simply come from, this is what I hear you saying. I'm really trying hard to listen to, you know, to your true position or your true belief. Mm -hmm. And this is what I hear you saying. Am I right? Am I, am I on the right page? No, that you didn't miss this or yeah, you are kind of getting it. There's so much understanding that can come from that. And in fact, you know, I'm not again in this area, but the research shows that communications research and other people actually, as they do that, are actually a lot closer in their beliefs mm -hmm. than they are, than they think they are prior to those conversations. Yeah, it's funny because as you're, as you're saying it, I'm imagining myself doing it with certain people yeah. and feeling on the one hand, incredibly vulnerable. Yes. Like they're going, their evil is going to swallow me up. Yes. And on the other hand, feeling how powerful it could be to do it unilaterally. Like that's yes. where I may have power to change them as opposed to right. the only power I have is to sort of like overcome them. Right, exactly. Yes, and there is, a. I think there's a, one of the safety pieces that comes in, you talk about vulnerability. I think to be safer in those conversations, what happens is, you know, you have both, both parties willing to do that kind of active listening. You know, if you're always in the position of, you know, listening to someone else and they never return that gesture, then that that's an imbalance that, you know, it isn't safe. It's, it's, it's a vulnerability that, that isn't useful. Right. Yeah. Right. All right. I think we're up to a, <laughs> all right. A, uh, the a stands for altruistic gift. Um, I also think of it in my own shorthand in my memory as acknowledging your own offenses. Um, but the altruistic gift is really based on um, kind of understanding that uh, you have hurt other people, acknowledging your own offenses, um, and then making a claim, uh, making a kind of a commitment to give a gift that is, in a sense, altruistic because the person didn't earn it. The person hurt you bad, and you have every right to not forgive them if you want. Um, and so it's an acknowledgement that there's something happening there that way. Meaning to, to frame your desire to forgive as a gift to them, an, un, yeah. an unearned yes. gift. Yeah, it helps to underscore, in my mind at least, it helps to underscore that, that this is not like, a, um, like you talked about, like, oh, there's something wrong with me because I haven't done this already. It's like, no, not at all. In fact, you're doing something pretty special here. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. you're going above and beyond here. And, and then just making that explicit, is that something that you wanna do? And we know that uh, for some folks, at least, um, framing it in that way is also motivating and, and really helpful for them, um, inspiring, in fact. Yeah, I mean, I, he I hear a lot of spiritual overtones in that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I like, lost, your, lost oh, your audio for a second. Oh, am I back? Yep. Okay, so the word that's bouncing in front of me is grace. Yeah that you know the unearned gift like if you want to be divine if you want to embody the grace that you've received you didn't earn life or breath or gravity or sun that um that this is this is how you you know what would jesus do or or whatever your tradition this right. is how you embody the best of it yes i think it's so true i think that the so many of the the great spiritual traditions would have uh words and concepts like that um, like the grace, like the loving kindness, um, like the rising above who you are and your own ego um, to do this for another. And so I think it is tapping into, into that kind of uh, world tradition, if you will. Okay. Great. C? C is committing to forgiveness. And so by the time you've done the R, the E, and the A, you've really made a, quite a journey. Uh, and by the time you get to C, we're really getting to the place where um, this is the stage where the person has 
made progress, has already started to feel the changes in forgiveness, has made kind of the decision and, and has some cognitive or, or thought changes about um, toward forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And so the commitment part is really to help people to, to market, to establish like this happened. And so, um, you know, we do different things with the commitment, depending on the, the, the people and how that might work. You might come up with like a certificate that, that indicates, hey, you've forgiven this person. Um, one that I like, because I kind of like playing with fire, is, uh, you know, putting a, a list together of all the ways that this person has hurt you or the ramifications of that hurt, listing them all out, and then sitting with it until you're ready to make a commitment to forgiveness. And when you're ready, burn that thing, you know, mm. just light it up. Um, and so there's all kinds of different ways that we might ritualize um, the commitment, but it's uh, this idea of, of, of marking um, the forgiveness. Gotcha. So I don't know if I'm anticipating whatever the H is or not, but I'm thinking like for, forgiveness is actually like a continual act. Like, okay, I burned the paper. Is this H? You got it. So H is holding on to forgiveness. Okay. So it's this, you know, you might think of it in, uh, you know, in, in recovery language, you know, we might think of this as like relapse prevention. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the, the H is holding on to forgiveness once you've achieved it, because we know that particularly with big events, uh, and when we think about our emotions, um, uh, our emotions alert us in a, in a non-rational way to potential harm. And so if we've been hurt by someone in a very, very powerful way, our emotions are our first line of alert. And so again, you might uh, have forgiven someone, but you might see them and all of a sudden your heart starts racing again. And, and you might believe like, oh, well, I must not have forgiven them because I'm all upset again. Like, mm. no, part of the age process is educating people and preparing them for, you're likely to feel these things again. Maybe when you see them, maybe when someone else hurts you in the same way, maybe when you're reading a novel and the, the character is like the person who hurt you. I mean, there's all kinds of ways that we can get triggered. Um, and we can have these emotional reactions. And again, it doesn't mean we haven't forgiven. Um, and that's when the, the rituals can be really helpful to look back on, to, to remember that time I, I wrote out that list and had a good time burning it. Um, or when I, I, I can pull out the certificate or, or maybe I've told a friend about this and I go back to them and I said, can you remind me what I said last year about yeah. that person? I did forgive them, right? Yeah. Um, these are all kinds of different ways that we H hold on to forgiveness. Gotcha. So we, we've already said that forgiveness can take years. Um, uh, and you, you've, you've outlined a process. What I'm curious about is, is can this process, how long does this process take to kind of jumpstart the forgiveness? And I'm thinking yeah. about a conversation I had a while back with uh, Gregory Walton, who does wise interventions, like an hour that can yeah. sort of iteratively change everything is, yeah. is reach one of those? Or yeah, I think, I think it's a good way of thinking of it. Um, you know, our programs, we've done them uh, in, in my own lab, I've done them as short as uh, four hours. Um, in, in other labs, they've even tried like one hour forgiveness interventions. Um, and what we've found is there's a pretty strong correlation between the amount of time intervening and the effectiveness of the intervention. Uh -huh. um, so you get about a, a tenth of a standard deviation of change per hour of intervening. And so, you know, what we find is, you know, in terms of like, if you're thinking about like a kind of a brief therapy or a brief intervention, you know, if you can do an eight, eight hour or 10 hour intervention. So one of the things that we've kind of settled on is more like a eight weeks, hour and a half each week, particularly if you're in a group setting. Mm -hmm. um, and so you get kind of 10, 12 hours of, of time thinking about, talking about, working on this, you can make a huge change in people's lives. Um, we've seen real significant improvements for folks. Again, mm. the timing is important. So the interventions that we do, you have to remember, are in the situation where people have already struggled with forgiveness. Um, ours is not kind of like a crisis intervention, if you will. You know, mm -hmm. we're not coming in right away when someone's been hurt. We're, we're down the road. You know, this is after people have been hurt, people have been struggling with it, people have tried to forgive in multiple ways and haven't been able to. And then in that context, our interventions tend to be very helpful. 
Um, and so closer to a hurt, I think people need time. I think people need time to be angry. I think people need time to find ways to set boundaries in new ways, like we talked about, um, prior to doing that uh, forgiveness work. Mm. And you mentioned at the start that one of the things you work with is like helping clinical professionals work with their clients. Do you, have you teased out the difference in effectiveness between the group and just doing this process with people on their own? Because my blink would be there's something really powerful about normalizing it in a group. Yeah. And that every, you know, that every, whoever's your story you're hearing, you go, oh gosh, if they can do it, like that was worse than mine. Yeah, totally. You know? totally happens. Um, you know, this is uh, one of the probably top three projects on our list next to do would be to actually randomly assign folks to either a group intervention or an individual intervention and, and test it that way. Um, I haven't seen any projects that have been done on that specifically. Um, but in terms of um, uh, um, comparing studies that are individual ver versus group uh, like in a meta-analysis where you put together several different studies. We've done that work. Um, and we've shown that the individual versus group, for the most part, there's no difference in them, that they're both effective. I think practically what's happening is you're, you're tapping into, when you do the therapies well, either individual or group, you're tapping into different processes. So the processes that you're uh, highlighting about group and, and the ones that I love about group are just that. Um, it's validation, it's, it's inspiration, it's support, it's all the energy you get from the other people who are also going through it. But in individual, you get specialized attention. Um, and that specialized attention can mean other benefits uh, that you get from your relationship with your therapist, with, from their insight with you, with their attention to you, um, your own time reflecting, you know, there's things that, that benefit the individual. And so I think what ends up happening is, is there's kind of a wash in terms of the, the outcome itself. But if we could do big enough studies where we actually are able to look at what individual factors might moderate those. So um, for example, somebody who really needs that validation, who's never really been in groups before, I'm gonna bet they're gonna do better in group than, than people who don't. I'd be interested mm -hmm. in personality factors related to how open people are to talking in a group versus not. Uh, how much fear, social anxiety they have versus not. Like I would imagine they would do better in individual than group. So there's there's all these other factors that you, you know, just unexplored yet. Well, you need a really big research budget. I know. Are you ready to help me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I got I'm all just kinds of ideas. It, I'm just putting it out there. <laughs> I love it. So, I I love it. It. so last thing I want to talk about is the the self-forgiveness yeah, piece. Great. Which seems like it's the same and different. Yeah, yeah, it is. It has some real, uh, I think, very interesting differences. Um, there's some uh, strong commonalities, as you, as you note. Um, the, the program that we've worked on and tested, um, uh, I did with a graduate student of mine who's now a, a professor, uh, Marilyn Cornish. Um, she, for her dissertation, created a, a, a four-step um, uh, program for self-forgiveness that then we tested and in, in some follow-up work. Uh, the four, these are the four R's of self-forgiveness is what we call it. And so those are responsibility, remorse, restoration, and renewal. And so um, the idea here is with self-forgiveness is uh, that that's unique from forgiving others is how do you account for the kind of true self-forgiveness versus just letting yourself off the hook. Mm. And that's the thing that comes up an awful lot when you talk about self-forgiveness is, you know, and in fact, there's theologians and philosophers who have even argued there is really no true self-forgiveness, that the only way you can be forgiven is to be forgiven by the person who hurt you. Um, and we would disagree with that. But we disagree only with the caveat that people have to pay attention to the responsibility piece, that it, this is not about letting yourself off the hook. I mean, if you want to let yourself off the hook, that's fine. That's a different issue. But that's not what we're helping you to do um, in our therapy program. So we're really going to take time in that first step responsibility to play out how much responsibility do you have in this. And, and that's a 
um, again, that, that's another continuum issue. We've got people on both sides. We have folks who defend themselves from kind of the vulnerability by saying like, well, it wasn't that bad. They might minimize it. They might kind of want to let themselves off the hook. And we try to bring them back and help them explore mm, what was your responsibility. And then of course, we have plenty of people who are on the other end who take way too much responsibility um, for the hurt. So one person from this study comes to mind who was uh, in our study because she was super upset with herself for uh, some ways that she had communicated with her father. Um, and she thought that she had been pretty judgmental and pretty hurtful um, and had said and, and written some things to him that, that she wasn't proud of and very upset by. Well, in the course of the, the study or in the course of the treatment, what, what came out shortly after that was that actually her father had been pretty abusive of her most of her life. And so here she was taking kind of this responsibility for this this, this letter, let's say, um, when really it was in this context, this much broader context of, of abuse and hurt. Um, mm -hmm. And so we helped her to see like, yeah, okay, you, maybe you could have been a little softer and a little less judgmental in your letter, but let's talk, let's talk about the context. Um, remorse is helping people to come to grips with the, the emotional aspect of it, the, the guilt they feel, the shame that they feel, we make a strong distinction between guilt and shame with them. Guilt being uh, the feeling that I did something wrong. Shame being I am wrong or there's something wrong with me. Uh, and helping people to move out of those shame spirals. Mm -hmm. We know that uh, shame, uh, that, that people who experience shame more or feel more shameful tend to not try to make things right, tend to not ask for forgiveness, tend to not uh, make amends as often as people who just feel the guilt. Yeah. Well, I guess when you feel the shame, there's nothing, you're bad. There's, it's, there's nothing to do about it. Right. That's right. And it, and it hurts so bad that to, to try and manage that with another person is, is it's overwhelming. That's right. So we try to do work around that for folks in the remorse stage with uh, restoration. It's about coming back to your values um, it's about trying to understand, uh, what you did to the other person. Um, it's trying to make that right. So if you, um, uh, we talk about making amends here, uh, in this process that part of achieving self-forgiveness is, is going back and trying to make things right if possible, or, or if not with the person that you hurt, maybe in some other way, um, by, by passing on. Uh, the amends to another group or to another person. Mm. Um, and then that renewal part is, you know, what are the values that you, that you um, violated? And, and can you kind of recommit to those and renew those um, so that you feel um, a sense of uh, commitment to those and can act out of those going forward? The idea being like, yeah, I violated those before, but that doesn't mean they're totally in the trash. I still value that stuff and going forward, I can make different decisions. Mm. Um, so kind of learning from that process to act in a new way. And, mm. and we've seen that this program, uh, the results of her uh, initial study on this were really impressive in terms of reducing self-condemnation, increasing self-forgiveness, even reducing psychological symptoms. I mean, it, folks were, you know, again, this is one of those things that I often say um, when I talk about forgiveness in my research is, um, I'm a forgiveness researcher and I've been doing this for over 20 years and I'm still shocked at how effective these things are. <laughs> I mean, mm. people will send in emails or, or call us or write in afterward and they'll, I mean, many times people will say like, this changed my life. Um, I think of one woman who, um, it had been years uh, since her affair um, on her, with her husband, you know, she had an affair, her husband and she separated. And in her self-condemnation, in her shame, not only was she not really effective in terms of moving on in her own re romantic relationships, but she was finding that she wasn't really attentive to her kids at all. So her role as a mother was suffering because of this, mm -hmm. because she felt like, who am I? I don't deserve to, to treat them. You know, I, I can't engage in them. I can't discipline them. Look what I've done. I'm terrible. And through this process, she was able to then talk about moving on from that and then renewing those relationships with her kids 
um, and being able to really be the mother to them that she wanted to be. I mean, these are, I mean, that's life changing mm. um, if anything is. So really powerful, yeah. powerful stuff. Yeah. So most of the people that I work with need to for, need, <laughs> have the opportunity to forgive themselves, but not for things they've done to other people necessarily, but for to how they've treated themselves. Yeah. You know, things like I, I've eaten poorly my whole life. I've, I'm not exercising. I'm not taking care of myself. Now I'm sick and I feel so much guilt and shame. Yeah. Does this process work in, in that domain as well? You know, I have every reason to think that it would. Um, we haven't tested that in that specific way. Um, in fact, we did limit our study to situations for people who hurt other folks. Um, so that was actually one of the kind of explicit things that, that we were studying. Um, but my guess is that uh, it should absolutely work in many situations. I think there is an extra complication that comes in that, that some uh, researchers have theorized about and talked about. Um, you know, if you're forgiving yourself, what does that mean if you've hurt yourself? Um, so there's some nuances there that kind of have to get played out. Do you, you know, who's the victim? Who's the offender? You know, it's, it gets kind of complicated. But many people, just like you're saying, do think in those terms of like, I hate myself for what I've done to myself. Um, yeah. I can't forgive myself for what I did to myself, you know. So I think that there's a lot yet to be done in that particular area. Um, and I would bet that much, if not all of our program would be very uh, applicable to that, to help people yeah. to walk through the uh, taking some responsibility, but also developing empathy for why they did what they did developing remorse, uh, working toward restoration, a renewed sense of values. Um, and I think that that can, could, could potentially make a difference, but I don't mm. have any data to stand on with that one. <laughs> right, yeah, I'm thinking about it in terms of like Hal Hirschfield's research on future self, that the person, the, yeah. the person who was harmed was present self and the person who did the harming was past self. Yeah, I love it. Yep, I, I think you could absolutely build build an effective intervention around something like that. Yeah. I, I love that I don't do this work, so I can just have ideas and they don't. <laughs> That's great. I, I, have I no, love it. I have no responsibility for raising them. Right. That's I, right. Exactly. I'm, a, I'm, I'm like a deadbeat dad. I just, hey. <laughs> no way, man. There's a much better, much better analogies out there. You're like the, <laughs> you're like the spark plug. You're like the, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> I guess I need to do some self-forgiveness around that. There you go. Yeah. There you go. So what's what's the top of your research agenda right now? What's the burning question you're working on? Oh, such a great question. I think for me, a, a general um, burning question is, um, how does this work in the real world? So, hmm. so for me, you know, because I'm I'm so interested in psychotherapy research, my quote, real world is the psychotherapy room, um, the group room. Um, where the intervention, you know, where, where therapy is happening. So, so far in my career, I've done a lot with kind of what happens when you specifically recruit folks for a forgiveness study, you bring them in, you give them a contained forgiveness study, and then you see what happens. Um, and like I've told you today, it's really effective, like surprisingly so. Um, it really helps people. But my next kind of question and that I've been uh, moving into. And, and in fact, we had a study set to go and COVID uh, derailed it last spring, um, is about what happens in like ongoing psychotherapy. So this is not for someone who comes to a therapist uh, specifically to receive a forgiveness program, but for somebody who comes because they're depressed or, or for example, that, uh, that mother who was in our forgiveness study. What if she had just gone to a therapist and talked about I'm such a bad mom and, and, and I, I can't relate to my kids and, and here's why and I'm stuck and, you know, and I don't have a fulfilling relationship with them. Um, how might we then in those settings kind of, in a sense, insert a forgiveness, uh, maybe a forgiveness module or, or program in the overall therapy that the person's receiving? How do we do that? And if we do, is it effective? Um, so I, I, I'm leading a, a therapy group right now, and, and my, my group members were kind enough to let me try this out with them. Um, so I, I didn't collect any data on it, but I just wanted to see, like, what did this feel like for them? You know, because we were working on other things. You know, we had uh, plenty of other topics, but, 
but forgiveness was one that had come up for them periodically. And I thought, well, what if we, what if we try to do a, a module? Um, uh -huh. and, and my reaction to that kind of initial foray is, is good and bad news. The good news is it was really helpful in a lot of ways. Like people were exploring at a deeper level. People were engaging in a deeper way with some of these hurts. And there was some, some definite healing that happened. The bad news was it was hard to contain it because there was so much other stuff going on. So, uh -huh. you know, we did two or three weeks and we'd work on it and people would be into it. But then in the fourth week, someone came in with something that was more urgent, you know, because mm -hmm. this is not a therapy group for forgiveness. You know, someone had some pressing stuff. And so we'd set it aside and we'd deal with that and, and we'd work with that and then we'd pick it back up. But, but it became more diffuse. And so I think the next step would be how do you provide that in ongoing therapy that's useful for the everyday therapist, not the forgiveness expert, that can help more people, um, again, not only for their forgiveness outcomes, but also for their, their psychotherapy outcomes to be um, you know, less depressed, uh, uh, more, less anxious, more uh, fulfilled. Right. And, and uh, ex you know, extending into real world, is, are there any plans to train like non-therapists? Like I could see myself really benefiting from learning this methodology and then leading my health groups and like yeah. you know like oh here let's you know it's we need to do four weeks on forgiveness because i'm sure there's some stuff going to come up or right understanding that oh forgiveness here is a red flag issue and i have some tools yes uh sounds great you want to get a get a training put together let's do it <laughs> <laughs> i'm always open to those sort of things i don't have any uh, specific plans uh, in terms of doing that, um, but uh, you know, right. uh, if we come, do. you will build it. What? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like yeah. So, and, and I think it's a, an excellent direction to go. And some folks have done that. Uh, you know, I think again of Ev's work, um, Ev Worthington. He he did some work on some uh, Christian college campuses um, mm -hmm. where he went in and and trained RAs, uh, resident assistants in the dorms. And then they would work with the people on their floor in kind of a, what he talked about as being a, a campus blitz um, mm. about forgiveness. And so they took like, I think it was a week or maybe two week period on campus. And they did all kinds of things, training the RAs. They did table tents about forgiveness. They did talks on forgiveness, you know, to see if the, if the community was talking about forgiveness and, and focused on it, what changes they might have there. Um, no, so absolutely, this stuff is, is applicable to all kinds of different settings and situations. Gotcha. All right. One last question. Um, and often I just ask people this in general, like what music are you listening to that you really are enjoying that other people haven't maybe heard of? But I want to ask you specifically, are there any songs or groups or genres or bands that specifically relate to this work? Like you, it's just sort of meaningful around forgiveness that you found oh. opens people up or has opened you up? Oh, such a good question, and I'm not going to give you a great answer on it. This is. Uh... <laughs> I, should, I, should, I should have prepared you for this one. That would have been great. No, I'm. I, I just, I honestly, I'm not the most sophisticated guy musically. I, I've got my strengths, and music's right, not you, one of them. Like? Um... <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm pretty mainstream. I'm a 90s guy. So I love my alternative mix, uh, you know, Soundgarden and, <laughs> you know, Pearl Jam. Um, my kids have got me into Taylor Swift. So, you know, I like her and, you know, I'll do all kinds of different things, but I tend to be pretty mainstream on it. And uh, whatever okay. the people around me are, are what uh -huh. kind of listening to is what I listen to. Yeah, uh, I think there's, there's a lot of forgiveness in 90s indie stuff. Like, there's a lot of anger. <laughs> no, I mean Nirvana. Like there's there's a lot of yeah anger turned on all directions. Yeah, yeah, so true, so true. All right, well we'll just put in Soundgarden and Pearl Jam, and, and I'm sure I'm sure there's listeners who who have skipped the '90s. <laughs> there you go. Go when, back when, and rediscover the grunge. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Awesome. Nathaniel Wade, thank you so much. This has been such a great conversation. I'm, Thanks so much. I've, I've learned so much. I think this is going to be so helpful to my audience. And I definitely want to see if I can get some health professionals to, uh, to get together and, and sit at your feet and learn. Hey, you let me know. I'll be happy to come and chat with y'all. But this has been really great for me, too. I really appreciate the uh, opportunity, Howie, and, and I appreciate what you're doing in trying to get this word out.
Thanks so much. Right on. Take care. All right. Take care. Okay. Bye.